Me too. I wish you could have been here. I wish we could have worked out. Uh, and I hope we get a chance to do that to show you our Conroy Center at some future time, should uh, your travels bring you to our beloved Low Country. I would love it. There we are, gang. Hey, Facebook audience. Welcome. And I see uh, somebody has already discovered our Q&A here in the Zoom room. Uh, thank you for that. Excellent. Wow. So, okay. uh, yes, we will indeed be able to save some time for audience questions here. <laughs> but before we do that, how about how about we do an introduction? That seems like a sensible way to start an author conversation. I'm Jonathan Haupt, everybody. I am the executive director of our nonprofit Pat Conroy Literary Center here in Beaufort, South Carolina, uh, coming to you from our recreation of Pat's office. Uh, and that is indeed a portrait of Mr. Conroy kind of hanging out uh, over my shoulder, keeping an eye on Jamie tonight as well. This is our evening with Jamie Ford, presented in partnership by the Conroy Center and our friends from Charleston at Buxton Books. Uh, we're grateful to partner with any number of independent booksellers across the Lowcountry and very grateful to Buxton for helping us out tonight. They have signed, uh, by which I mean book-plated copies of Jamie's novel available both in store and through their website. Uh, and if I'm feeling industrious, maybe I'll post a link at some point tonight uh, to that store as well for y'all. Our guest, who we are absolutely honored to have on screen uh, this evening, is the award-winning multi-genre author, Jamie Ford. <laughs> Jamie is the great-grandson -grand of Nevada mining pioneer, Min Chung, who immigrated from Haiping, China to San Francisco in 1865, where he adopted the Western surname Ford, thus, as Jamie puts it, confusing countless generations. Truly. <laughs> A topic that we will return to, uh, both the idea of generations and confusion. I think we'll probably circle back around to both of those. Jamie's debut novel, an exquisite, exquisite novel, Hotel on the Corner of Bitter and Sweet, spent more than two years on the New York Times bestseller list and won the 2010 Asian Pacific American Award for Literature. It was also named the number one book club pick in 2010 by the American Booksellers Association, and it's now read and taught widely in schools across the country. His work has also been translated into 35 languages so far. Jamie was raised in Seattle, also a topic uh, we will circle back around to, uh, but now makes his home in Montana. His latest novel, The Many Daughters of Afong Moy, became an immediate New York Times bestseller and was named the number one indie next list pick for August. It's also a selection of Jenna Bush Hager's Read with Jenna Today Show book club, and on the Today Show, in Jamie's appearance, it was announced that the series has also been, or excuse me, the novel has been optioned for series development by Jenna's production company. So congratulations, Jamie, and welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, that was a lovely introduction. Um, all good things. Well, I was either going to do that or mention how you once bought a piece of Pat Conroy's clothing at a Pulp of Queens convention, but you know, you can't, you can't fit everything into an introduction. I, I still have it. I was thinking about that today. It's hanging up in my closet. I, I wanted the scarf that he had in one of his author photos, but someone yeah. beat me to that. Or is it at the Conroy Center, perhaps? I don't remember who ended up with that scarf, but it's the one that he was wearing in the author photo for My Reading Life uh, and maybe for uh, for South Abroad. So it was about that time. Yeah, lovely yeah. white and gray scarf. Yeah, I do remember when that went up for auction. You got uh, a lesser piece of clothing, <laughs> I, as, as I, I recall. But sentimental I in its way. It, it is. and. And I'm not a small guy, but Pat was a little bigger than me. So it's it's not even something I can actually uh, wear. I, I look like I'm wearing, you know, my dad's shirt backwards in a painting class in the third grade. <laughs> That's a difficult look to pull off. I would, it not, is. So I, I would not Clearly. recommend leaning into that. Um, what I what I, I'm so excited for you, first of all, so many things happening all at once, all good things. And, and I know, you know, it seems immediate for us on the outside, uh, whereas you have known about things before they are publicly announced. That's that's mm -hmm. the way it works. But I'm curious what it feels like for you uh, as an author and really a, as sort of caretaker of Afong Moy's story as well to, to be ha enjoying this level of, of success for the novel and for yourself right now. It's surreal. Uh, my, my first book, 
did so well that it it created a a shadow that was hard for me to uh, get out from under. And I'm so happy that this book is doing so well. But now I realize this book just created another shadow <laughs> of expectation that I have to contend with all over again. I mean, it's just the hazard of having, uh, you know, a, a reasonably successful book. Um, the character of Afong Moy is someone that I've known about for decades. And I, I, I wanted to write about her, but I couldn't quite, I wanted to write a story that had an aspect of redemption and her story really, you know, her real life story does, it's a little unclear how it ends, but it points to tragedy. And um, I, I just, I didn't want to make up uh, a happy ending or a, a different ending out of whole cloth for her but by giving her fictional descendants, then at least her legacy, the next, you know, the next generations can have a better, richer, more fulfilling, uh, more satisfying lives. And I could give her a voice that way. Did you know when you started down this path that you wanted to do something that was sort of simultaneously historical, contemporary and speculative all at once? Or did that just sort of grow naturally out of the idea of legacy and you just went as far as you went, which took you indeed into the future? No, I, I knew I wanted to write, even after my first book, I thought at some point I was going to end up in a place where I'm writing historical and speculative at the same time. It just seemed like a bigger canvas. Um, I grew up reading a lot of speculative fiction. It's almost, it's almost my mother tongue in a strange way. And I had thought that I would eventually end up there, but with the success of my first book, I, I created a box of expectation for myself, readers, my publisher, that I was gonna write primarily historical fiction. And I set out to write uh, a book that was primarily historical fiction that I didn't want to write. <laughs> I had to give myself permission to just put that project in a medically induced coma and allow myself to write what I really wanted to write, knowing that it would probably um, not make my publisher happy and it may not be a good fit. Like I'm, I'm stretching my rubber band. They may not want to have their rubber band stretched. They may want to just everything to be the same. Um, and I, I did, I ended up leaving Random House and going to Simon & Schuster where it was just a better fit for, um, I, whoever I'm evolving into as a writer, um, I just, I just feel like I'm, I've been let off the leash a little bit. Um, and it's a good feeling. You mentioned uh, having to switch publishers. Did your agent stay the same through this whole process? Do you have a supportive relationship there? Yeah, and my agent was great about it. My agent, she, she didn't hesitate at all. She really liked what I was working on. And she thought if they didn't want it, this is, this is a fresh start. I mean, a, a fresh start is a nice way to put a positive spin on not having a publisher, an editor, or a book contract. <laughs> you know, homeless is being, it's also a fresh start. <laughs> not everyone wants that fresh start. Um, and I, she had more confidence than I did because my previous publisher was less than enthusiastic about this project. I kind of thought this was you know, this might be a sinking ship and this might be it. Um, I mean, we're writers, we're just, we're bundles of insecurity, um, you know, just, and it's interesting. Uh, I think Jason Mott, who won the National Book Award this year for a book called Hell of a Book, yeah. uh, North Carolina writer, he, he was in the same quandary where he wanted to write this, this different kind of book and, he, and his publisher didn't want it. And he had to make that internal decision of, Am I going to just be who they want me to be, or I'm going to embrace some different artistic paths and, you know, just <laughs> see where it goes, even though it may be a plane crashing into a mountain. Um, but it, it worked out for him. It worked out for me. So any writers yeah. are yeah. watching, you know, be true to yourself. Jason is a, a dear friend to us here uh, and has I been love a couple of times to participate in Conroy Center events, both for Hell of a Book and for his previous uh, speculative novel as well. And, you know, talks about that, that very thing about 
you got you got to be true to your artistic vision, even if the business side uh, doesn't seem like it's going to follow you. And then when you're proven, you know, not only right, but you have this sort of meteoric rise to international celebrity status, you feel pretty good about your decision making. But you don't you don't know that's going to happen when it's just you and your self doubt in the keyboard, right? At, at Truly, yeah. yeah he, I love Jason. He's such a good guy. That that, that I'm just when that ha when that all happened and uh, people you know are not always aware of the circumstances they just think someone's path to success is paved with you know uh gold steps and you just ascend to uh this level jason had to take an extraordinary risk and um sometimes authors take those risks and i don't it would be a stretch to say we believe in ourselves it's because that would say we have more confidence than we actually do. It's more of like we we can't keep ourselves out of trouble, and um, and sometimes it's the good kind of trouble. Well, let's uh, stick with the idea of fame and instant fame for a second, because I feel sure. like maybe we might be leaving some percentage of our audience behind by not mm -hmm. adequately explaining just who Afang Moy is and, and what mm -hmm. the historical figure is who is at the heart of this multi-generational, nearly 250 year story that you've crafted. Uh, so could you give us sort of a, a, a thumbnail sketch and maybe how sure. you became aware of, of Afang Moy as well? Yeah, Afang Moy was a very real uh, woman. She was the first Chinese woman to come to America, she came to this country in 1834. For a hot minute, she was the most famous woman in America. She toured up and down the Eastern seaboard from Canada to Cuba. She performed in sold out theaters. She was a sensation. She was written about in more than 200 newspapers. She went to the White House and met with President Andrew Jackson at his request. But in all those newspaper articles, we never hear from, from Afong. It's always the voice of the people who are have monetized her, who are promoting her otherness. And all of this excitement, it, it really obfuscates the fact that Chinese women at the time couldn't leave China. And if they returned, the punishment was death. So she wasn't here like Nellie Bly as this world traveler. She wasn't here as a cultural ambassador. In all likelihood, she was sold into this life. And the last anyone hears about her is in 1849, someone reports that they have seen her living in a poorhouse in New Jersey. And so like so many you know, momentary celebrities, you have your moment in the spotlight and then you know, our culture moves on to the next shiny penny and you're sort of cast off. Um, and that's, that's the last anyone you know, hears about Afong Moy. I, I first learned about her in a newspaper article in the early 90s. I think it was an article in the San Francisco Chronicle. And it was an article, not an article, but it was a full page feature celebrating Asian American History Month. And it started with, uh, I think in the 1500s with some Filipino sailors who had landed on the West Coast. And it went all the way to the 90s with uh, Christy Yamaguchi winning the, the gold medal for figure skating. And nestled into this timeline, as I'm skimming it, was a mention of, it just said, Afang Moy, first Chinese woman uh, to come to America, takes the stage in New York City, 1834. And I, on occasion, went down that rabbit hole to learn more about her. I, I spend a lot of time in newspaper archives, and so I can, I can find these articles that, um, that met all of her, covering all of her appearances and her travels. But again, um, she was so famous, but she had zero autonomy of her own life. And so I, I just thought she was a very fascinating person and certainly someone who deserves to have her story told, um, or at least just have her presence or historical presence remembered. Um, and also at the, at the time that I was writing this, uh, there was a play premiering called The Chinese Lady. Uh, I have a, I have a, I have the I have the written play around here in my office somewhere by uh, Lloyd Su. Um, and it's, it's a slightly different take, but it's an excellent play. Um, and I, I've seen it. I've done uh, Zooms like this with the directors of the, of the play um, as it's been performed around the country. Let's circle back around to uh, to Jason Mott, because, uh, you know, a comparison is, is occurring to me as I'm hearing you talk. 
Uh, Jason's novel, Hell of a Book, is really sort of a, a bringing together of two things that were, were rising to the fore in his imagination. Uh, and I remember uh, when he came down here to Buford uh, for an earlier novel and was just, you know, over dinner, over drinks, sharing stories of weird things that had happened to him on book tour, uh, as authors tend to do in conversations with each other and, and occasionally with an audience, if that's part of the show. But, you know, that he was thinking about writing that and it just sort of, there, there didn't seem to be enough substance there. And then the Black Lives Matter movement happened and lots of things happened on a national scale. And it sort of added to the context in which he could tell this very personal story and sort of escalated from there. So it was a coming together of two things that kind of seemed like they didn't necessarily fit together that did. And in your case, we have the historical figure of Afong Moy, but also this big idea that you explained so beautifully in the preface of uh, transgenerational epigenetic inheritance. Uh, were you aware of both simultaneously or was there a moment when you can kind of see this, this is the tool that I can use to tell this particular story? How, how did those things come together to manifest in this novel? Sure, I, I'd been aware of, of epigenetics for uh, maybe just on the inside of 10 years. Um, I live in Montana and we have a Native American population. I have Native American friends and they, they've talked about living with generational trauma forever. You know, outside of a, of a scientific context, it's just something that it's, 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 it's accepted. Um, but I began to notice articles. Um, there was the one, the, the one that raised a lot of eyebrows was a study done at Emory University in 2013 that showed one traumatic event had been transmitted across a couple generations in lab animals. And that was significant and interesting, but it kind of went into the attic of my mind. And over the years, I, occasionally I would see things pop up, you know, in Google news and it was, oh, a study of the descendants of Holocaust survivors or a study of the descendants of civil war prisoners. Um, and suddenly it, it, I, as I was kind of toying with this idea um, I, I actually was meeting with my therapist several years ago and she asked what I was working on and I said, I think I'm going to work on a book about, about inherited trauma and her eyes lit up and we talked at length and apparently that's, this has been, you know, uh, in the therapeutic world for decades. Um, and there was an article on, on Gwyneth Paltrow, uh, published a piece on how she, there's a thing called family constellation therapy that she had discovered and it was very helpful for her. So it, it seemed to be entering the zeitgeist from a, a bunch of different angles um, about the time that I was trying to put together this new book. And it, it seemed like I could take Afong and I could take this, uh, uh, a, a, a scientific, that's not a discovery, but an acceptance of a possibility and I can link the two and it's like one plus one equals 10. I can suddenly tell a much larger story and each piece sort of magnify the other. Mm -hmm. you, uh, you mentioned it uh, within the scope of trauma and certainly that resonates throughout the novel. We, we encounter women who are carrying a weight, not necessarily their own uh, and, and I'm not quite sure how, about how to deal with that. But you've also referred to this and I think accurately so as an epigenetic love story. And, and we have we see that transmitted across time as well. And, and love in many senses, familial, romantic, platonic, uh, the love that say is inherent in, in loss or remembrance as well. Uh, and, and, and I would say also the love of, of self, the acceptance of self that, that is possible over time. Uh, and maybe even what, you know, Mr. Conroy, who's still hanging out behind me here, always referred to as great love, which is, you know, the, the charitable love of all mankind, or at least the possibility of mankind, you know, perpetually being on the cusp of a better version of it, of himself. You kind of cover the whole terrain of love in the story and rather beautifully. Uh, uh, so one, congratulations on that. That is, that's really what resonated with me as I was turning the pages and crying frequently, I will admit. Uh, but but what do these characters for you as the writer? What do these women do you think have have to teach us about love? You know, all the studies focus on trauma because it's it's more easily recognized, more easily measured. It's it, it manifests in a larger way. And I I kept thinking we must inherit other things. Um, there was a study of children who were born blind 
um, blind at birth, and it was a study of their facial reactions to surprise, to fear, to joy, laughter. And they mimic their parents' facial expressions, even though they've never observed them. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's, we inherit positive things as well. And, and if we can inherit trauma and sadness, can't we inherit uh, an emotional IQ or resiliency or a capacity for love? And I like love stories. Um, I mean, a way of that, that it kind of, you know, I probably should have put it in my, in my author's note because it's, it's something I wasn't sure I wanted to go there, but, um, but it, it was something that was very profound for me. My best friend growing up, we met in kindergarten. We're still friends to this day. And in his late twenties, he came out as gay wasn't a surprise to me, um, it, but it, it didn't matter either way. He's my friend for life. Um, unfortunately, I lived in a community where it was very accepting and I was in a, a family that was very accepting. And then my son in high school, his best friend, uh, not long after high school came out as gay. And he came out to my son in high school. It's the only person that he came out to. And I thought, okay, that's interesting you know it's... and then my other son his best friend in high school came out as gay and it there must be something about us the, the Ford boys that we're artistic we're super sensitive and it's almost like I think queer kids in high school you know might be more comfortable in the music department and the English department than uh, the, the football field you know, just, it's just uh, things we're more interested in sensitive things rather than the collision of, of helmets. Um, but I thought, I thought that was like a really interesting parent child coincidence, but I, the more I thought about it, it had to be more of, of who we are, um, that how we, who we interact with, who we befriend, who we love. I think we inherit that too. Um, that's, it's, it's kind of sad because you can say, well, then must racist and bigoted people are going to have, they're going to raise racist and bigoted people who are going to hang with racist and bigoted people. Um, so I try not to think about that too much, or it's just it's totally depressing. Um, but I do think uh, things like love and acceptance and friendship, and again, emotional IQ, I, I think those things are transmissible genetically. It sounds a little, a little Deepak Chopra woo woo to say that, but mm -hmm. really most people, when they reflect on their own families, they have those moments where they're, I mean, there's the funny tragic moments where they're like, oh God, I'm my mother. Um, but there's also the moments where they see a grandchild and they go, that's my dad, or that's my mom. We just see patterns of behavior, um, how someone carries themselves, how someone speaks, um, and again, they're emoting behavior that they did not observe in their own lifetime. Um, and I just thought that focusing on love, I, I do think of, um, sorry, this is a long answer to a very short question, but um, I, I say it often. I really feel like I'm not just a writer, but I'm someone in the compassion creation business. And there's a deficit in our culture. And I think if you can create art, whether that's you know, music or a play or a book or poetry, you inject that into the body of a society, you can in a tiny way inoculate that society against many of the things that bring us down, bigotry and homophobia and sexism and classism and, and those kind of things. I think that's what Pat did with all of his books. I think that's certainly what Jason did with his most recent book in a huge way. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's it's great to write books for pure entertainment but if they can on occasion be a little bit educational and possibly edifying then I think you know we're kind of hitting a, a high note as a as an author and an, as an artist it's it's a wonderful thing to aspire to um, certainly for any artist and any writer 
and Pat received letters really his whole career from from honestly the great Santini onwards so third book first novel mm -hmm. 1976 letters that would say over and over again Mr. Conroy you saved my life mm -hmm. and sometimes people would mean that figuratively meaning you know I, I feel acknowledged I feel seen someone else had an experience similar to mine and was able to turn their trauma into something beautiful into art but sometimes they would mean it quite literally that 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 book talked them out of self harm or, or suicide uh, to, to get that message uh, on the page that presented so beautifully that uh, they did feel recognized maybe for the first time in their life they didn't feel alone, uh, which is you know a beautiful message to give uh, to to speak to the idea of representation. Um, but also, as, as you say, and, and I love this phrase uh, to be in the compassion creation business. Uh, this is the first conversation you and I have had, although we've been in each other's orbits for a while, but you just, you radiate with compassion, um, just in the way you carry yourself and certainly in the way uh, that you that you write your stories on the page too. So uh, thank you for doing the work that you do. Oh, it's it's funny you say the way I, I, I carry myself. I, I met Pat at uh, the Pope with Queens, the gathering in uh, East Texas uh, about a dozen years ago. And we, we really didn't speak much. I was too intimidated. And, um, I, you know, you get to know Pat and you realize that's ridiculous. Right? Yeah. <laughs> He's such an approachable human. Um, but he, after I got home, he sent me one of Pat's emails, which, you know, it's like, like as he described it, like, a, you know, a monkey with a keyboard. Um, yeah. It's a... a uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of the, the uh, how does this uh, computer thing work? But he said, um, he just sent me a very complimentary note, just said he appreciated how I carried myself. And I, wow. I hung that on my wall for 10 years. <laughs> it was such an honor from someone that I admired. Um, and it's nice to have a best-selling book or win an award. But when one of your peers, not just peers, one of your, your idols um, notices you, um, that kind of validation is, uh, is, you know, it's, it's, it's the best. He was so good at doing that because he didn't get it early on. It, it took mm. him a while to, to, to feel like an author, not to feel like a writer, but to feel like an author, to feel like he had been, been welcomed into a profession and a, a community. Uh, so, you know, he was the first one to open the door and welcome everybody else through once, once he felt like he was in there. And there were there were years at Pulpwood Queens, um, and maybe including the year that you two crossed paths, when he would get in in the line and buy every single book by every single writer there, you know. And for a relatively unknown writer, maybe that's the only one you're going to sell, but you're going to sell it to Pat Conroy. That's not a mm -hmm. that's not a small thing. Uh, and he was aware of that gift. He he was very aware of what he was doing and why he was doing it. Yeah, he, he did just that. And we all wanted to give him our books. And he said, when someone offers to buy your book, you say yes. And we're like, yeah, sure. <laughs> A good lesson for the rookies, as Pat would have mm -hmm. described it, I'm sure. I want to uh, circle back around to um, something we, we jumped off of, uh, but, but I think it's worthy of note and discussion. And that's the idea of of representation, but also who has the right to tell which stories mm -hmm. this is you know, a topic of, of tremendous interest and some great frustration in publishing right now, and certainly among readers too. And it generally centers around ideas of race or orientation or gender, uh, occasionally religion or, or topics beyond that. But, but the idea of writing as the other and what you do so beautifully in this book, and certainly not just in this book, is occupy the lives of female protagonists, of female point of view characters. Um, so I guess my two part question is, do you ever get any resistance to doing that one um, and two, how do you do it so damn well, James? What's the secret? <laughs> oh, um, this with my second book, um, that was when I began to get the, that reputation as like the, the dude that writes women well, because <laughs> I have the name Jamie. So that's a little hmm. uh, ambiguous. And I would walk into interviews and like the host would say, you're a guy. And I'm like, I, I am, I have a white chromosome. It's, it's sorry, this is who I am. Um, with this book, I, you know, I saw one review where the, the reviewer said, you know, just raved about the book, but then said, I'm not sure how I feel about a male author 
writing all these uh, female perspectives. Um, and I'm sure it's, it's I, I, I get it. Uh, but, but by and large, including a book, I visited with two book clubs last night and, and we talked about it. And, uh, and, I, and I asked them, I'm like, how did I do? And they all, you know, they basically cheered. Um, and for, for me, um, all, all the weaknesses that I perceived in myself in high school became my strengths as a writer, became my superpowers. Because I was that, when I was in the fourth grade, my parents sent me to poetry camp. I was, I was a different kid. I was the little boy that read all the Judy Bloom books. I was um, in high school. I, I took a lot of classes that young women took, and I didn't know that at the time when I signed up. And so I would just look at my electives, and I, I'm not interested in auto shop or metal shop. I was interested in practical family living and classes like that. I thought, that sounds interesting. And I'd walk in, and it would be like me and the one uh, queer boy in high school who was out and 28 young women. And my friends used to say like, oh, you're taking that class to be with all the babes. And I'm like, I, I just wanted to take the class. Um, and so I felt really uh, inadequate in so many ways in high school. I didn't play football, I didn't play basketball. Um, no one, you know, being the boy in high school who cries at sad movies and sad books, that's not an asset. <laughs> Uh, the young women are not lining up to uh, go to the prom with that dude. Um, oddly enough, there, I had another friend who took sewing classes and he made his prom dates dress. And oh, that was man. a awesome move that at, like every girl in the school swooned when he did that. So um, there is sort of like a, a stereotype of a male in high school. And then there's, there's the rest of us and we we have a, a place in the world as well but high school is a cruel crushing environment um luckily i had very loving nurturing supportive friends but instead of kind of being embarrassed by that as a writer i just lean into it and um and it's it's my my comfort zone um i'm there are people who are better intellectually and emotionally and creatively equipped to write books about gun battles and asteroid collisions. And I'm more interested in books about the human heart in conflict with itself. Um, I think that's kind of, you know, the essence of the human condition, um, certainly the essence of my condition. Um, and I, the, the poet Kim Stafford um, said something to me that I never forgot. He said, writing is not about talent. Writing is about courage. And I, it's true to, to write possibly out of a normative experience and to write someone else's experience. It, you're putting yourself at risk. And I, I think as authors, we should write about anything, but be aware that if we write about someone else's experience and if it's a traumatic experience and we do it poorly, we will pay a price. Um, and so some people aren't, aren't, aren't going to go there and they probably shouldn't go there. Um, but if you can go there and, and then people appreciate it, then I feel like you've performed a, a, a nice act of empathy. Um, and again, it was just going back to kind of the, the oddball, very emotive child <laughs> and very emotive man that I have become. Um, it, it's it's kind of who I am. It's it's good to know that about yourself, and and to find a creative outlet that you know not only serves your needs but can can speak to so many other people as you do, and, and do it in a way that's recognized and appreciated. And as you say, there there are others who make the attempt, but but do not stick the landing, and that's what people mm -hmm. will remember, not the attempt, but the the reaction to it. Uh, so it's a risky game. It's it's risky to occupy your own skin on the page too. It certainly was totally. a risk that Pat took, you know, in twelve different books to to always write from an autobiographical perspective, whether it was uh, fiction or nonfiction. 
and to be so committed to that, you know, that mm. when he would talk to writers who didn't do it, he would genuinely feel bad for them that, you know, I'm sorry that you can't do that, that you're uh, either nothing, either you're not aware that anything has happened to you that's worthy of, of being written about in a novel, or you're just not brave enough to do it. Pat, Pat was genuinely sad for people who couldn't take that risk. And I'm wondering for you, are there bits and pieces of yourself in these characters? as well yeah i'm all over my books i'm i'm the same way i i, I do believe the best art is personal mm -hmm. um that being stated uh, there's some things about my my own father that i that i just learned in the last two years that i know i should write about and he's passed he's been gone for 20 years mm -hmm. but i'm i'm just it feels so indulgent i guess and I, it shouldn't be because it's more therapeutic that maybe that's the better term to process your own grief, to process your own trauma, to process, you know, your, your own family secrets on the page. Um, I think it's a healthy uh, exercise, whether it gets published or not. But yeah, my, my first book, I tried to distance myself from my characters. People would say, are you this character? And I'd say, no, no. And then my wife would be in the back of the room nodding like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so, um, I, you know, my first book was very much, I mean, the, the subtext is, is, it's a father-son story. And my second book is a mother-son story. My third book is, you know, sort of a, a story of conflicted love being pulled in multiple directions. Uh, this new book, much of it is cycles of trauma in my own family. Um, it's not super transparent on the page, but it's there. And people that know me, they, they know where it is and they see it. My wife certainly does. She, she, she took some things a little too personally. <laughs> she's like, she's like, is that, that's me. And I'm like, no, that's not you. And, um, and so I have to, I have to qualify it sometimes. Um, but I, I do, I, th I think, it's interesting because I, I'm definitely the type of writer that I do that, you know, you prick your finger and bleed on the page. And the characters are in many ways an echo of, of the author. And it's definitely, you know, it's, there's an autobiographical element to most of what I do. Autobiographical element to everything Pat did. And he, he didn't, he didn't run from it or hide it or disguise it. It was just there. Um, and so authors do that. And whenever I say that, there's a part of me that thinks, okay, Brett Easton Ellis wrote an American Psycho. So what's his family life like? <laughs> hey guys, what kind of childhood does that guy have? Yes, it, it gets worrisome if you follow the thread too far. Sure. Right, yeah. <laughs> truly. Uh, Wiley Cash, who's a dear friend of, of mm. Jason Lott, certainly of us here at the Conroy Center, you know, says the, the one person he can't write about is himself. And yet, if you do a deep dive in conversation with Wiley about some of those characters, you know, it, it, you will, you will see traits manifest, you will see that bits and pieces of him are there, whether he whether he did that intentionally or not. It, there is something deeply personal about that creative act, as, as you say, in the context of, of this book, uh, were there characters who were more joyful than others to write for you Were the characters that you looked forward to spending time with? Um, um, I think that's my question. Yeah, it sounds, I mean, it's interesting. I, I think I threw up a, a Twitter poll asking readers who their, or maybe it was on Instagram, who their favorite character was. Mm -hmm. And it was not anyone's favorite character. It was uh, not that it was a despised character or anything, but I think people gravitated to some other characters. But the character of Greta Moy, mm -hmm. her storyline is contemporary. It's set in 2014. Mm -hmm. Part of it was just the mechanics of it. it. I really haven't allowed myself to write contemporary things. And mm -hmm. so just being able to write a contemporary character was so liberating because I didn't have, it didn't involve so much research. Um, and I didn't have to worry about anachronistic language and you know all the things that, the little bugaboos that slow down the process for writing historical fiction. But also it is just an unabashed, uh, it's, a, it's very, it's, it's, the most direct love story of all the narratives. And it made me, I wrote that and thought, wow, maybe I should write a contemporary, you know, literary romance because it was fun and it felt good. And it, 
felt true to my own authorly voice such that it is. Um, and so that, that, for all those reasons, that was my favorite character. Mm. I like Greta quite a lot too. There's the sense of, of yearning, of, sink, of seeking rather in her story that is really memorable throughout. Um, yeah, and it is, as you say, uh, very contemporary too. So it, it does feel immediate that, particularly in the context of, you know, a 250 year narrative right. that, that feels very immediate, immediate, that character is very easy to connect to uh, as well. But you, you bounce back and forth between characters and therefore between time periods. And I'm wondering, you know, what your organizational structure was, <laughs> if any. I'm, I'm imagining that sort of, you know, serial killer hunting slash conspiracy theorist board with the red thread connecting the photos and all of that. Is that, was there a physical manifestation of this or did you, you work it out in your head or on a screen? I do have some black thread. on. <laughs> I think some, one of my children must have, have moved it. Um, uh, yeah, I call it the wall of madness because it's oh. the wall of my timelines, of my notes, right? I'm calendaring everything out. I'm, I'm collecting bits of research I don't want to lose. Um, and I actually did a, a literal page count because I, I wanted to make sure Dorothy, who is technically the main character, I wanted her to have just slightly more pages than anyone else so that, that, that there had to be a correct tempo. Um, and I didn't put up the black thread, <laughs> but I thought about it. That's all that was missing was the, you know, the thumbtacks connecting yeah. everything. Um, I, ha I have some arrows in, in lieu of me actually going that far because um, that would just be a, a, bit, a bit too much on the nose. Um, it was, this was a harder book to write than some authors do these kind of things beautifully and, and maybe they don't struggle. I struggled about halfway through writing this book. I thought, what have I done? <laughs> I've bitten off far more than I can chew. Um, and I had to change how I, I work actually. I don't tend to take characters and write their whole story roughly. I tend to polish as I go and edit as I go. But I, about halfway through the book, I had to step back and write each character's arc really rough, really fast. So I could weigh it all together and then uh, lattice it all together from that point and then rewrite the whole thing. The, uh, the latticing to use your word is fascinating to me because the architecture of this is, is so well done. There is a rhythm to it, a heartbeat of sorts uh, where you know, as we transition from one character to the next, you still feel the echoes of the character you just left. And in an almost predictive way, you can start to feel the echoes of the character you're about to encounter, or at least it feels that way when you, when you make the switch to the next chapter, the next, uh, the next narrative. How did you do that? Did it, did it happen organically? Or did you try multiple variations, multiple combinations, and just landed on one that felt right in the end? Um there's there's some mechanical things that i i, I have some certain tendencies mm -hmm. um mechanical makes it sound like it's far more uh methodical than it is it's more of just uh a desire to leave breadcrumbs um and i sometimes i leave those breadcrumbs just for myself as a storyteller so that i can jump back into the story and i know where i am um and those things become an assist to the reader. There, it's funny, there's almost this literary trope in, in my, my, my agent calls me literary with a little L and I'm very comfortable with that because uh, I want to be a storyteller first and a writer second. And I'm, I don't apologize for that. Um, I, but there's almost this literary trope that if the book, if you make it too easy for the reader somehow you're you're less of a uh as as pat would say you belong to a lesser house of literature mm -hmm. and i don't buy into that there's this idea that if you have chapter headings that that's too much of an assist and a serious reader wouldn't need that and it, and they can be taken to the extreme there's a book called the kindly ones it was 900 pages critically acclaimed, has no paragraph breaks, no chapter breaks, 900 pages, 
that's it. And, and yet the author of that type of a book may bemoan the fact that people don't want to read it because it's, it's, he's made it very inaccessible. Yeah. And I, it's not that I want to hold the reader's hand and you know, write down to them. I'm not doing that at all. But I just think the, in telling a story, I should do it in a way that the reader is saying, what happens next? Instead of how many more pages do I to get through before I know what's going on? Yeah, hmm. it, it's a difficult balance, but it seems like you have, you hear it, you feel that rhythm in some, in some inherent way. Uh, and this leads me to the, the last question I'll ask before we open it up uh, for sure. audience questions. Uh, so those of you who are in the Zoom room with us, uh, you have access to both the chat and the Q&A, so you can leave a question for Jamie and either of those, and we'll get to those in, in just a couple of seconds here. But, uh, you know, the novel has a lot to say about poetry, which of course has a rhythm to it as well, uh, and unapologetically so. This is, this is a story in which poets and poetry are revered. Uh, so I'm wondering if you'd be willing to talk a little bit about your own relationship with poetry. And, and how that seeps into this novel. It's, it's funny, I didn't even think about this question, but I just, but the polishing touches on a, a, a bit of poetry that I was working on this week and then tuck it in my file where no one ever sees it. <laughs> it's so personal. My, my poetry is very Anne Sexton-ish. It's all kind of confessional. Um, and it's just for me. Um, occasionally I will read it um, for, uh, for a special occasion. Um, there is a, I live in Montana. Um, there is not a large black population in Montana, but there is a vibrant one and they have, they celebrate yesterday or we did it over the weekend, but I think it was Monday was black poetry day, national black poetry day. And so there was a big event in coordination with the bookstore and a library. Um, and they invited me to be a guest reader. Um, and they invite someone from uh, our native communities to participate as well. I'm always happy to be included, but I, I read poetry, which I never do. So I, I only share my poetry on like special occasions, I think. But it, it means a lot to me. It, it always has. And we talk about people writing to Pat and saying that Pat's work uh, saves lives. Um, there are spoken word artists that save lives. I, I see it. Um, I've seen it in my own family. Um, and I can't overstate that. An artist like Andrea Gibson saves lives. Um, there are there are people, I mean, particularly teenagers, or, or college age, or are people just at any point of turmoil in their life where they have so many emotions that they, they, they can't process them. Teenagers will process them through, you know, loud, intense music, and other teenagers will process them through just powerful spoken word poetry that gives their emotions a place to go and where they feel understood and they feel validated and they feel safe. And I think poetry has such a bad rap. I think our, our, our school system, you know, takes poems written in the 15th century and bonks 10th graders over the head and it's good stuff. But if you press it, play on a YouTube video and it's someone like Andrea Gibson performing in a sold out theater, something very personal about their identity, that connects with so many kids on such a deep level at a time when they need that the most. And it's, it's, I think it's a, a misunderstood part of our culture that's been lost in the shuffle of, you know, football and Netflix and Starbucks. I think it's seen as this, this antique and it's alive and well, it's just in a different context. Um, but because people grew up with a certain type of poetry, they're hesitant to give, to give it a shot. Uh, I, when I meet with book clubs, I always encourage them once a year at a book of poetry and watch the performance, uh, not just 
because classical poetry was always performed live. It, it, it was read aloud, whether in a parlor or in a theater. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think it has, it, it belongs in our culture in a larger way. So I'm always an evangelist for poetry. It's, it means a lot to me. I know it means a lot to, um, to a lot of people. And unfortunately, we, there's, there's artwork that is sort of like hotel artwork you know, that came from Pier One Imports. And there's poetry, I think, that is almost like that version of poetry. It's kind of bland and created as an echo of something in the past for the masses. And it doesn't find purchase in anybody's hearts because it's, it's just, I'm, boy, I'm just like on my soapbox about what's wrong with poetry as I share my poetry with no one in the universe. Um, but I consume a lot of it. And so I, I know there's good stuff. Um, I, years ago, I saw Derek Brown perform in a sold out theater in Portland, Oregon. And it was the first time I'd really seen a powerful spoken word performance. And it changed me. It was just like, it was like a system upgrade for my heart. Like it just rewired things. Um, and I can send some of those recorded pieces to people and it's like magic um how transformative it is it's like opening it's like oh here's a whole world of you know heartrending passionate art that they didn't know existed um so anyway I'm, that's why i'm an evangelist for poetry i wish there were more uh and i appreciate that you are one here in south carolina we have uh, some really remarkable spoken word poets and slam poets uh, glennis redman our friend who is the newly named poet laureate of greenville south carolina first ever City Poet Laureate for Greenville is, is phenomenal and does that um, all across the country and has taught kids how to do it in performances that have been held in Washington, D.C. And just up the coast from us, our friend Marcus Amaker, who's the outgoing, uh, in every sense of that word, City Poet Laureate for Charleston, uh, did a beautiful Poets in Schools program. Uh, and it really made poetry cool and accessible and uh, for high school kids in a way that I hope we will we'll be able to replicate here in Beaufort County. Marcus is going to come down and talk to us about that. But there's a physicality to what both of those do, not just in terms of the movements that accompany, you know, the performance of the poems, but you as the audience member feel that you are physically moved uh, emotionally and in, in your body when the performance is just right, when they can quite literally, in some cases, shake the floor uh, mm -hmm. and, and get the room to echo with the reverberation of their voice. That's power. That's mm -hmm. magical. That's what Conroy loved about poetry, too. He could imagine that. He could get it off the page, as some mm -hmm. people can, but other people need the experience that you're describing to convince them uh, to cross that threshold. Um, and, and to find, you know, that kind of endorsement for poetry in this novel that on the surface doesn't seem like it's going to be about poetry uh, was such a wonderful discovery. So I really <laughs> appreciate the way oh. that you manage that. I, I think that's one of the special things about Pat's work. It's so lyrical mm -hmm. and shamelessly so. Like, yes. it's, like it's may not be perfect for everybody, mm -hmm. But those people need a hug if it's not perfect for them because <laughs> they're porcupines and someone didn't hug them enough as a child um i just i love i savor pat's work mm. pat's brother tim is a poet as is his sister carol of course uh and tim right. and I collectively put together a presentation uh, which was originally titled pat conroy as failed poet which is how he saw <laughs> Uh, but we can't, it, it's been, uh, you know, delivered under ne many different names, but it's very much about Pat's arc, about how he figured out how to take everything he loved about traditional poetry uh, and transfer it into his beautiful lyrical prose. So by the time we get to Prince of Tides, which is more or less the halfway point in his career, you know, he's able to do it on, on virtually every line. He's in complete mm -hmm. command of, the, of that skill set from that point onward. But it takes a while. It doesn't happen immediately. And it's interesting to, to map the arc of that. Um, maybe I'll end with a Conroy question. We've had some wonderful welcoming comments in our Q&A, folks inviting you to come down to our low country, which I certainly echo, uh, but not uh, a question at this point. So there's one I kind of skipped over that we'll circle back around to, to end here. You know, Pat uh, did something that so many Southern writers did, did so well, and that's make place a central character as well. The low country has an arc. It, has a, it changes over time in Pat's stories, sometimes quite dramatically. 
And for you, that, that setting that is also a character seems to be Seattle. It's, it's what you circle back around to in multiple novels. And Seattle changes quite dramatically in, in the course of this novel as well. What is it about that city that, that makes it both character setting you know, and muse, perhaps, for you as well? What is it about, about Seattle for you? Yeah, Seattle's, Seattle's the home of my heart. You know, it's where my grandparents are buried. It's, it's where I lost my virginity. It's where I first had a beer. Um, you know, it's all my formative years, good and bad, are, are based in Seattle. Um, and I do think writers write about what they lament. Um, and I'm, I miss Seattle. I miss the Seattle I grew up in, which doesn't exist anymore. Um, the, the musician songwriter, Jason Isbell, uh, who I think is a magnificent songwriter, he has a line that's, um, daddy said the river will always take you home, but the river can't take you back in time. And daddy's dead and gone. And that's how I feel about Seattle. Beautifully said, uh, I think. Uh, Pat's connection to the Low Country is very similar to that. It was the setting of his boyhood, of his formative years, of where he found his voice and began his arc as writer, as teacher, as servant leader. It's, it's where everything important in his life happened. And during the 20 years, he couldn't be physically here because he just wasn't welcome, as hard as that is to imagine now. That was the place he was always trying to get back in his, into mm -hmm. his imagination. Every, everywhere he was in the world, he was still writing about the Low Country. Uh, and beautifully, so much so that it sends people here to this day to see if it's real. And when they discover it is real, they make it their home. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Home. It's like a one-man chamber of commerce for the whole country. <laughs> Truly, <laughs> it's just, he's a he's a force for good. I, yes. I know I'm sure there are locals that mm -hmm. that might bemoan the tourists, but oh, uh, yes. um, you know you you can't remain frozen in time forever. Perhaps that'll, you'll have that experience at some point, too, where uh, you get a letter from someone who's moved to Seattle because mm -hmm. of a Jamie Ford Vulcan. That's when you start asking for commissions from real estate agents. <laughs> build that into your business plan. Absolutely. Yes. Well, thank you, Jamie. We are out of time. The hour goes by very quickly. We have uh, been talking about uh, The Many Daughters of Afong Moy, an absolutely exquisite novel that's available anywhere, and I certainly encourage folks to get it. If you are so moved, you can order signed book-plated copies from our partner for tonight's program, Buxton Books in Charleston, and I know they would appreciate that, as I've certainly appreciated your time, Jamie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, and someday I'll be there in person. I look forward to it. You take care of yourself out there. You too. Good take night, care. Everybody. Good night, everyone.